How are you doing, folks? Very welcome. Thanks for tuning in again. This is segment. This is part two of a two-part interview. I had the fantastic opportunity to do it with Ron Harmon. Ron Harmon, as we all know, is Ron Harmon, who's the demand behind Big Bud. Um, there was only a very few amount of Big Buds built before Ron Harmon came on board. I suppose, really and truthfully, Ron Harmon is the man from the 747, the biggest tractor ever built. And on the previous video, uh, this first half of this interview, one of this, the first section, we call it one of two, he spoke of the development of the 747 and what they had to do and how they discovered how much power they needed and what weight they needed to get the power onto the ground, to pull the, the big chisel to plow to the developers to go with it. Um, so that's there if you want to watch that. If you haven't watched it, if you have watched it, this is two of two. Um, my interview with Ron Harmond. Um, he picks it up here. Look, that's it. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Subscribe, hit the like button, hit the share button, and hit that bell for up maybe more notifications or whatever. Cheers, guys. And any anything we talk about is going to be on the link and the description down below. All right. Cheers, guys. Keep up the good work. Thanks for watching. And if you're going to pay for them over two lifetimes. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's the same. You know, the tractor sizes might be different, but the concept's the same, isn't it? It's the same mm -hmm. everywhere. It's the exact same, yeah. And just, I don't know what's happening in Ireland, and then as well, and in the UK, and even I think it's happening with you as well. There's a lot of farmers getting out, and there's nobody to replace them. So the machinery has to get bigger. Because the neighbor is renting it, or the fellow up the road is renting the land, and it just goes on from there. So I suppose yes, we we get bigger eventually, but it'll take another long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's well, it's it it, it it's all relevant because over here, you know, <clears throat> you you have a much higher grossing mm -hmm. um, dollars per acre than we do. Mm -hmm. Like in in Montana here, if we raise. 50 bushel an acre of wheat that's about our county averages up here and you know at five dollars a bushel you know we're barely able to get uh 250 dollars an acre and uh that 250 dollars an acre and and uh maybe 150 to 200 dollars of that is is actual cost mm -hmm. certainly 150 is with you know, the margins are pretty tight. So you have to have a lot of acres to get back and, and there's not a lot of help available. Yeah. So it just forces the issue of the size of the tractor. But a lot of times you can take a very small farm somewhere and it might be a quarter of the size of the farms up here, mm -hmm. but actually grosses more dollars mm -hmm. and certainly nets more dollars than some of our big farms. So it, the efficiency of that forces the use of big horsepower. It just forces it to happen. Yeah, because you, you have to have it. And I suppose, like we spoke there before, what the fellow you did build the 747 for, he, did he have um, an issue with the window he had for planting? He only had, what you telling me, about six weeks? Right. Yeah, you know, the only, you know, he raised two crops a year on some of his ground there and so on. Basically, he only had the month of December and most of January, not every year, but at least half of January. So all of his deep tillage work had to be done within a 60-day period of time. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't come back and do it later. So he had that window of time. He had to deep till his ground and then get ready for planting. And uh, so, yeah, it was, a, it was a timing issue. It was also a volume issue. He had three D9s doing a third of his acreage every year, every three years he'd make the rotation. But he just found that, you know, like he told us, yeah, he, back in those days, that tractor was 300 and some thousand dollars and he paid for it. He's pretty sure either the first year, by the second year for sure, mm -hmm. but the efficiencies difference bought that tractor most likely the first year he owned it. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it's, it's just a matter of a, and he didn't do it because he just wanted to have the biggest tractor around. He did it because he was trying to accomplish that goal, mm -hmm. and we were able to help him do that. And, and also, it's not rocket science. You know, where most of the technology comes from 
We would like to think if you're a farmer, it comes from some of our major manufacturers in farming. But where the, where the ITV transmissions came in and all that, and where the newest engines come out, most of that is all in the construction side because the average construction piece of equipment, they're running three to 4,000 hours a year, okay? Mm -hmm. So how long does it take them to figure out a good engine or transmission? If you're running two or 300 hours a year in our country and over there probably more, yeah. it takes many years to determine a bad engine or a bad transmission. So it, but the reason they won't do it is because they want to be in the part service business. If they're using a generic <clears throat> engine or transmission from industry that's readily available everywhere, that is counter towards their business model of selling lots of parts and service and taking care of their dealers. So that's, that's the problem. They don't really want it. It would be better if they did, but they don't want to do that. No, no. Like some of the majors here now we're finding is probably the same with you is um, their, um, their, what you call it, the engines are not being tested. And what's happening is after four or 5,000 hours, the engines are getting completely and utterly burnt out because their engines yep. are being built so delicate now because of, we have this thing here. I presume you have it as well. Maybe it's called AdBlue. And um, the AdBlue is just causing a major, major issue. It's causing a major headache for a lot of farmers. And the AdBlue as well, if you mix water with it or if the AdBlue gets any bit dirty or anything like that, it just it just creates such a headache, and most most farmers in Ireland, and probably most farmers in the states as well, they're not they're not up to dealing with Ed Blue and all this kind of stuff. But it's there, and I presume it's the future, and they might improve it. Right. <clears throat> yeah, we uh, we see that too, and uh, <clears throat> so you know, uh, I guess the way we go about things isn't probably for everybody. Uh, we don't do much of the smaller tractors because of, of efficiency of, uh, of components and that type of thing. They're, it's harder to get generic components the smaller you get. They're specific uh, because when you talk about mining, construction, uh, they all tend to use larger horsepower, so that model fits us better. But, uh, but it is interesting to, to see sometimes i <clears throat> i know this is less true in in europe <clears throat> and uh asia but over here there's three or four different truck companies well when you go in to order your truck <clears throat> they normally they some of them do have their own engines but when you go in to order your truck you buy a chassis of the size and the type you want when you order it but you pick out your own engine and you pick out your transmission and you pick out your axles you pick out your suspension system and really all you're really buying is a is a cab and chassis mm -hmm. uh, okay. and uh, you're just buying a cab and chassis and so at the end of the day um, those components are used by many other people in different components. So it isn't just mining construction. It's actually the trucking industry. Mm -hmm. And we like that because when you go buy a Peterbilt truck or a Kenworth truck or an IH truck in our area, uh, uh, you can find that trucking people also put on many more hours than let's say an average farm tractor. So it either is a truck part or it's a mining construction part that's already proven that we love to use because we're never skunked when it comes to finding that we can get a part wherever the tractor may be. Yeah. And uh, so heavy duty truck parts are a, a good option as well. Brilliant. And you know, I suppose Ron, we were talking about, I suppose for people that mightn't know the size of, of some of the big buds, but we say, am I right or wrong in saying this? The big board, the 747, I think it's measures in about 25 feet wide, something like that. Yeah, it's uh, it, it right now it is that wide. It's wider than it was, mm -hmm. and it used to be about 22 feet wide, and I believe it's close to 25 feet wide now, yes. Yeah, and the other thing, of course, is what people might realize is when we're talking about the size of these tractors, 
the big boy 747, when that's all hooked up to its planters and its tillers and everything, it's covering roughly about an acre or an hour. Am I right in saying that? Uh, and well, it's it's or, it's covering about about an acre a minute. An acre a minute. Correct me, I was wrong. An acre an hour. <laughs> That'd be very yeah. slow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, About an so, acre a minute. And 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 actually, it's probably better than that. Uh, you know, I mean, for instance, we took out that eighty foot chisel plow. One of the things I I like to look at is we can take that. And if we take the uh, the miles per hour, an average of five miles an hour times times uh, the 80 feet, we'd be doing a minimum of, of 400 acres in an average day. And we would be able to uh, do more than that. I think we've actually done as much in an average day because of speed and efficiency there, probably done 600 acres or so. So it's... Yeah, you can you can cover a, a cover a lot of a lot of acres, and of course, as your fields get smaller, there's more moving, there's more fold up time, uh, then that's harder to do. But uh, but the combination of speed and working the proper depth and doing a better job that way and not be limited by horsepower. Sometimes you can take the same tool and increase the speed by a mile or two an hour, and maybe it's doing a worse job. So in that case, it doesn't work, but in other cases it does. And so the ability to, to have enough horsepower to never be limited by horsepower alone is a big deal for farmers to find efficiency. Also, <clears throat> most all tractors have power shifts in them, but we use what's called a torque converter. That's what construction industry uses. So instead of having a, a clutch or a pedal on the floor to start your load off with, we have a torque converter, which means that one of our applications, we bury water lines. So in our country, because it gets so cold, we got to bury water line six feet deep. So if we take a water line and put a big shank on it, we can do something that most of the industry can't, because once that shanks in the ground, if you tried to use your little clutch there to get yourself moving, you're going to lose your clutch before you get moving. But with a torque converter, we can, we can develop full horsepower at a standstill. Mm -hmm. So, and then it, and it won't lock up the transmission until it gets to that first gear speed. So we can protect the transmission with torque converter, but that adds some cost to it, but it adds, adds a lot of dependability to it. And so uh, I used to, because nobody else was doing it, we built up some units <clears throat> to do that. Also, when they were moving the transatlantic cable, which was the missile system across the country, <clears throat> they had this cable that was wrapped in lead, and so it was considered to be toxic. So we built some tractors with plows that would deep rip over the top of those cables and pull them out of the ground and roll them up, and they'd cut them off and sections the length of a trailer like a 40-foot trailer <clears throat> and some of these lines were buried next to a highway so it's compacted soil so we took two 650 horsepower tractors and hooked them together each weighing about 75,000 pounds and actually uh, pulled the cable out of the ground we also buried fiber optic cable uh, in in a roadbed or not a pet pavement now but in a next to a a roadbed. So there's a lot of applications you can do, <clears throat> which would normally be trenched. Yeah. It would be normally be a hole dug and then filled back in and compacted. And uh, we were able to do uh, many miles per day. And with minimal uh, work done behind it, we had a little bit of a trench there, but just take a small unit and, and, uh, and just, uh, uh, t take care of the little bit of the hump in the ground there where it's at and we're good to go. So there's many other applications that really aren't farming, but we're using farm tractors yeah. to actually hook on to different kinds of equipment and do different kinds of work over the years. Brilliant. Of course, there's no, there's really no end to whatever, if, if you can tie on to the back of it, you can go. Tell me, I suppose, Ron, 
I suppose we're talking the big boy, the 747, she can go up to, we say, 1300 horsepower. But do you think there will be a bigger tractor built? It's the, bigger, it's the biggest tractor in the world since 1977. But are, th are they going to run into an issue with um, weight and traction and everything else? We, we know the engines are there and the transmissions are probably there too, but are we going to run into a major issue with compaction and traction and everything else if we go up, we say, to 2,000 horsepower? Actually, it's all relevant. There is no end. Uh, the, 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 the end is the equipment behind it mm -hmm. uh, is more of the controlling factor than the, you know, if we wanted to build a 1500 horsepower tractor or 2000, uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure, but for instance, if we take uh, the new Titan tires that are out, the 1400s, uh, I do believe that we can probably get something close to 1,500 horsepower, get the power to the ground. The pounds per square inch is the compaction issue, and we've got so much tire on the ground, I could get up to around 150 to 200,000 pounds and have no more pounds per square inch than some of the new tractors out there that are all weighted up. So <clears throat> it's all relevant to that, but so the question is, what are you going to put the efficiency of folding something up at the end of the field, moving it to a different field and folding it down is a limiting factor. The width of highways, the width of roads, because most farms aren't all blocked up mm -hmm. around here. You've got, you've got 600 acres over there and you have 300 over here and you have 2000 over there. Mm -hmm. And, and so the ability to move this stuff around, I think is a much more limiting factor than the, and the equipment that's available that you can pull. Yeah. But uh, here's what we've always felt back in, when I took the company over back in into 74, going into 75, a 250 horsepower, 300 horsepower tractor was bigger than where the majors were at. The majors are now at around 600 horsepower. We believe that, <clears throat> that the largest capable tractors with existing equipment that the rule of thumb is double. So in other words, we have a number of customers that could buy a 1,000, 1,200 horsepower tractor, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, just the way the industry has moved and the horsepower needed, and that's been true from uh, the time I first got involved. Uh, uh, so back, by the time I got to 76 and 77, they were all at around 200, 250 horsepower. We were, our best selling tractor was a 525. <laughs> and as we've moved up and as they've moved up to 400 horsepower, <clears throat> it was normal for us to build a six, seven, 800 horsepower tractor. And here we are now with 600 horsepower tractors. <clears throat> we're a little behind the curve because we're not really building tractors at 1200 horsepower, but it'd be n interesting for me to tell you that I get calls, <clears throat> not daily, but certainly once a month, of somebody actually wanting a 1,000 to 1,200 horsepower tractor, and they have a specific application for it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're doing quite a bit of is in the Midwest, we, we put drainage tile in. They have excess water, and they've got to get water off of these fields. So burying a, <clears throat> a tile is a pretty big thing. And I had a guy that was wanting to put down be able to go down four feet <clears throat> and put down several drainage tiles at once. And it was going to take a 11, 1200 horsepower tractor to do it. But he justified it because that plow can all be folded up pretty much the width of the tractor. He can go to another application instead of doing just one line at a time. So there are <clears throat> applications like that, that, uh, that are still, that our people are talking about a thousand plus horsepower tractor actually quite often. So it's, it's, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I'm not talking to any of these guys about show and go, or they want to have the biggest tractor mm -hmm. or what it's just a matter of weight components that will handle that weight and horsepower. And what we're, what we do that is, unique, I think, is put that all in a frame 
that has nothing to do with those components. Mm -hmm. In other words, we build a basic frame so that if we're wrong about the axle or transmission or engine, we don't have a throwaway tractor. We can pull that component out and put it in it. But it's been interesting. Uh, sounds like we're touting our success. We're not. We're touting the success of industry that has proven their components over time. That's all we're touting, that, it, that you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out to go to mining, constructioning, or over the road big trucks or big mining trucks or whatever. They are our test bed. You don't have to have an R&D department. You don't have to have a testing department. They test it for you every day. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is, is, uh, is figure out what's really working for them. And if it works for them in that environment, it'll certainly work on a farm. So mm -hmm. it's pretty simple, really. Yeah, well, Ron, I can put it this way. If you, if you ever decide you need someone to test a big bull, I will be available. Do you know, oh, you, you okay. can just call on me. Look, I, I, I'll do my best for you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, we'll yeah. keep you in mind. Yeah, you, yeah you're going to put me on top of the list. <laughs> yeah. You know, like you said, some, like I drive trucks here sometimes, and like some of the trucks here, some of the trucks I've been driving, they have over a million kilometers up on them. Like, there's, right. no, there's no farm tractor with a million kilometers up on the track. Right, exactly. That's yeah. why we test it. Yeah, that's, that's the test bit. And, and like I, <clears throat> I tell this story sometimes, I remember I went and I was going to build a 747 and the transmission was my biggest concern mm -hmm. because it's not like a piece of construction you have to have really a lot of field speeds. And so I went and looked and I found some mining construction equipment that met, met the standard. And I remember going into this big conference room and we were gonna be ordering about 120 transmissions for a 10 unit production per month schedule. And the president who happened to be the owner of the company, his family, uh, we were talking about these transmissions and uh, he goes, well, that'll be great. He says, we'll build you a big bud transmission and uh, it'll be special to you guys and uh, boy, we can get you any field speeds you want and this will be a wonderful thing. And I stopped him kind of mid-sentence and I said, actually, I don't want that. Uh, I've been looking at this. I've been looking at your big 100 to 140 ton rear dump coal hauler trucks that have your transmission in it. I found some of them with 10 and 20,000 hours on them that never had a transmission problem. Mm -hmm. And I really, really liked that transmission. And I remember him leaving, leaning over the conference table to me and he says, uh, Mr. Harmon, uh, you, don't, you don't like the parts service business or you know, what, is the, what is the deal here? And I said, exactly, I don't. I, I want proven components. And I said, the only thing I don't like is you in your wide ratio or close ratio transmission, I'm only going to have a 10 mile an hour road gear. Um, I, and so the only change we made is we put a little simple air valve at the bottom of the transmission that allowed one slider gear to move over and make an overdrive out of fourth, fifth, and sixth mm -hmm. is the only thing unique about that transmission to a big butt. It's a very simple thing. And now I can go farming, have nice close ratios, and I can pull out onto the highway instead of being a slow mow, I can put it into higher range and away I go down the road 25 mile an hour. Yeah. So that's an example of what industry thinks. They think you wanna hang your name on it. You wanna be in the parts service business. You want special only to yourself. And from the day you go down that road, you're just no different than anybody else in the industry. You can't keep parts around. You might run out of parts, got a farmer setting in the field. Nobody knows how to fix it unless you make a special manual for it. But I was able to take uh, a, a, the transmission I put in the 747 and 77 had been built since 1963. So I already had from 63 to 77 with all the transmissions out there to prove, yep, that turns out to be an excellent transmission, okay? No testing needed, no nothing needed. So anyway, that's how I think it ought to be done.
Yeah, I agree with you. And it's pity, like like we said a while ago, if some of the majors, by the time they figure out that it's either a good engine or a bad engine or a good transmission or a bad gearbox, it's gone out of production with about five or six years. So, That's right. Tell me, Ron, I suppose one last question for you. Do you think it's something in the future that you would... I know you're, you're using your... Um, your chassis and all this, the grandfather in tractors and so on. But do you think it's something you consider in the future that you or your, your company there will go back into making tractors again or make, like we said, yeah. make a 1500 horsepower tractor or something? I think the most we're going to be doing, uh, we've kind of changed our status from being a, a company that just made a, like I'd make a, 20 or 30 500 horsepower tractors and then i'd make 20 more 600s and i'd do this or that i i don't think i will be doing that uh, i think that we're quite busy bringing the roughly depending on how you want to count them between four and 500 tractors we built i think we're fairly busy these days just bringing them back tractors that are 40 years old mm -hmm and uh, bringing them back and refurbishing them, putting them back out again uh, is I think our business. I will say to you that I've talked to some other companies that specialize in manufacturing. And I think I would go to a, one of those companies that are already set up, have all of the tooling that they need to uh, build a new line of tractors. And I think we would be in that 750 horsepower to, to uh, 850 horsepower range with these next tractors. I'm actually talking to some industry people and then we would be part of the marketing effort, but we wouldn't be the only marketing effort. So it'd be a tractor built by them and it would be called a big bud and it would have the same con concept as we have been talking about. Yeah. Standard off the shelf components already used in industry. The, but when you build a new tractor, you are tied up with tier four final in our country. You said you mentioned tier six, tier seven, eight. Uh, you are tied into that. Now, the one good thing about that is it turns out that the tier systems are, 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 are the same in a way, but here's the difference. If you tried to take like make Case IH and Deer and the rest, they're using smaller engine and just pushing the horsepower to the absolute limit. And they don't care if they run more than 10,000 hours or not. If you take a tier four engine, tier four final engine, and it's oversized and you're not pushing that engine to the limit, it's surprising how good that system works in compared to the small engines being pushed to their limit. So as long as you use the same concept we're talking about, overbuild, buy larger engines and derate them uh, is the way to go. Not small engines and try to push them to the limit. Yeah. When you're building a, hard, a, a large volume of things, that might make financial sense for you to do it that way. But it certainly does not make sense to the end user or the customer who has that unit five or 10 years later trying to keep it running. So. Uh, so the underlying concept, if that's there, you can actually use, uh, because if you build a new tractor, the government's going to force you to use the, the tiered engines that are acceptable out there. But you, it makes you buy big engines. Uh, I talked to a guy the other day that was looking at maybe we're going to maybe put together something with him to build some models. And we're, we're going up and using... Uh, uh, 18, 19, 22, and 30 liter engines uh, to be able to accomplish what we're talking about with these different horsepower ranges. And we're derating them. We're derating them. And when you derate them, all of a sudden, you're not asking the, the, uh, the regeneration systems and the def systems to be nearly as much as they were before because they're not being pushed yeah. as hard as they were before yeah. and it's surprising on a, on a test stand what those engines do at the kind of horsepowers we're talking about 
So the duration, buying a bigger, like our transmissions are rated at 950 horsepower, but we've only got a couple tractors running at that horsepower. But we, most of them are all in five and a quarter, 600s and 650s. So if you want to update that tractor, you're not updating the axles or the transmission because they're already overrated anyway. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're, they're underrated, I should say. And so anyway, if you build a tractor that way, it gives you lots of options. If you build the tractor the way the major companies are building it, uh, you've got what we've got today, and that is not a long-lasting tractor, high maintenance, and at some point, you won't be able to afford to keep it going any longer, and it'll get parked on the fence row, and that's the way it is. And maybe it's by design, and maybe it's not, but the end result is the end user is the one that's going to pay the price. It is, and that's going to keep the cost of tractors, probably new tractors, very high. And right. after a very short space of time, the tractor becomes kind of completely valueless because even the parts, it, yeah. the same parts is going to go on everything. So the parts are right. completely burnt out. If it's burnt out in yours, it's probably burnt out in mine. And then right. you, you can't get replacement parts. So it's, it's a vicious, vicious circle. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing the major companies are doing, I don't know if it's happening over there, that I think is really bad, and that is that if you, on certain engines now that the majors are using, when you go to buy an overhaul kit for them, you can't buy one. Uh, the majors are pushing rebuild centers. So mm -hmm. you might, now you can buy an outside part like a pump and a turbo, and I'm not saying external parts are available. But if it's an internal problem, they talk really hard about you just pulling your engine out, putting a new uh, factory rebuilt engine in it. It's normally not new. It's a factory rebuilt and putting it in. But the engines like on the biggest tractors, these 600 horsepower tractors, the transmissions are 50 grand. The engines are over 50 grand. But I can go buy a comparable engine, same horsepower from Cummings for half of that. So why in the world would you, on a smaller engine, pay twice as much yeah. as you can ge generically? I mean, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what's going on, too, is that not only is the parts hard to get, you got to wait for a, their tech to show up. But when you get down to writing the check for the repair bill, it's substantially more than normal generic components that are already proven. So in many ways, it's a it's. It's double duty. I mean, it's it costs way more. The depreciation's way higher, and uh, the ability to get it fixed uh, timely is not very good. So, I mean, there's I I really have a hard time finding much good about it yeah. in any way. Yeah, what's happening here is um one of the majors what they're supplying is what they call a sharp lock. And what a sharp block is, you don't have the head and you don't have the sump. What you have is a crankshaft, your four or six pistons, and that's what you buy. And you use your own replacement head, but it's just, you're talking yeah. massive money. And that's what they're pushing. They don't, you can't buy liners, you can't buy pistons, you can't that's buy right. pistons. You just have to buy that's, the sharp block. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you have to buy a short block or a long block. And they want to sell you the, the whole engine assembled. And they tell you how, how much better that's going to be. It'll be faster for them to switch it out and all that stuff. But they, they, they don't throw in there the cost difference. One of the things that we did on, on um, an engine, happened to be a Case IH engine, same thing, couldn't buy overhaul kit. They sell you each ring separately, each bearing separately, and of course, by the time you get the parts prices out, <laughs> and, and the problem is, is that even if you were a different company that built engine kits, let's say, mm -hmm. and if you build an engine kit for that system, but if you don't have the right codes to put in there to tell the computer, by the way, I'm taking the engine apart and I'm putting the engine back together, your tractor will neither run nor start. And if you didn't use genuine uh, component parts from the dealer, he won't help you get your tractor started either. Yeah. I'm going to share with you one last, a couple of things here. 
One is, is that they're talking about the right to repair bill. Yeah. And it's going through our legislatures over here where we're trying to get the major companies to allow like a truck, over the road truck or construction equipment. You have a standard reader. You can plug into it and figure out what the problems are. Uh, you can't do that with the new tractors unless you're a Case IH guy. You got the newest revolving passwords plugged in your computer overnight. You can't fix it either. And we think that's wrong. Yeah. So one of, one of the things that we're pushing is the right to repair. But at the end of the day, uh, all of this adds to the cost. It adds to the depreciation of the equipment. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm saying it again, I guess, but uh, the depreciation rates on this new equipment is almost double what it used to be 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I blame that in part on the design of what they've done in limiting parts and repair, yeah. but nobody else wants to buy that piece of equipment. They already know that as it gets older, it has more and more electronic issues and the value of it to the end user is much less. Where you take an old tractor, you can get fixed the values are going up. So I think the, I think even though we've got it figured out, a lot of farmers just can't stand the idea of buying themselves a 30 year old tractor. You might doll it all up and fix it up, but it just seems wrong. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a, a real good idea, but it's coming around. I'll tell you, it's, it's coming around. Actually, there's a company here. I do a small bit of work for, and they had um, one of the majors, we won't name them. And this, this, this company now would be very, very good for looking after their equipment. They have their own very up-to-date shop. And the, the tractor was going out. And it went to come up with a computer um, system code error, whatever, one, two, three, four, five. But all it was, was the main dealer had to come out and plug in. That's all it was. And it took about 15 minutes but the main dealer charged about 250 euros for that 15 minutes. And yeah. just like, they just wanted to be plugged in, but it's just, that's the way it is. And, but I hope that would be very interesting legislation if that got passed. That well, it's, it's, uh, they, they did get some right to repair laws. I believe Florida, Florida and Georgia, I believe it was. Don't hold me to that. But they're finding it very difficult to, to get through because there's one other aspect of the ag business that's really changed. Over here, there's very, very few independent dealers left like us. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you're Case IH, you're Deer, you're any of the major companies, again, I think these companies are good companies. I'm, yeah. I'm certainly not saying that. But, but I, the problem is that they, like... Uh, I think the Case IH dealer here has 10 locations and the John Deere dealer has more than that. And Agco dealers has somewhat less than that. But the point is, if you're here in my general area, you basically only have one dealership to go to. Oh, and they're buying up, they're closing out us small dealers. And so you really don't have a choice. I mean, even if you thought you had a choice, you don't have the choice you used to have. So, that's, uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, but and the legislature, then, when you get the dealers association to show up, now, this is the same dealer association that represents you, your little dealership. Yeah, guess what, they're totally against this idea of right to repair, right? right. They're saying, they're highly technical equipment. Now, we don't want farmers or these uh, bad mechanics coming out to work on your equipment. You want professional people that have been trained. I mean, they get up there and give a really good talk, but at the end of the day, they are trying to control the parts and the service business. And, and very few people are speaking up for the individual farmer and what it's costing him to do this. So it's a big challenge getting right to repair done. Like you're talking, and we would refer to them here, vice grips, I mean, but like, right. yeah. It's, yeah. it's either that you're going to talk to the fellow with the laptop is going to be 150 euros an hour. <laughs> so, right, right. Yeah. 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 It would be interesting to see if that, if that got through. It would be very yeah. interesting and to be, to, be, to be good for the world. 
Yes, it would. Yeah. Yeah. Ron, I, I can't think of a whole pile more to ask you. We could probably stay talking about tractors all day and all night. I would anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I appreciate the call and uh, you've been really good to visit with here. And if there is ever a time that we can do anything else or discuss further, be happy to do it. Thank you for what you do too, getting yeah. the word out uh, uh, like you do. There's not not a lot of people left doing that. They're, they're part of the bigger uh, corporate group. And so it's nice to have somebody to talk to that understands uh, what's going on here. Well, thank you for saying that. And you know, like, first of all, folks, this is my second time <laughs> doing this with Ron. Ron, we did this, how was it, about two weeks ago? And my computer yes. crashed and I lost everything. So Ron, thank you for coming on. And like I said to you the last time, and I want to say to you again, you to me and a lot of other folks that admire tractors and all that, like you you are probably our generation of Henry Ford and Harry Ferguson and so on. And you know, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And if you do decide to open a test center, I hope you will keep me in mind for <laughs> Yes, I will. Yeah. We certainly will. Thank you very much. And if I'm ever over that side, you hope you can arrange me to get a draw you in the big boat. We'd enjoy having you here. Please come someday. We'd love to have you. Thank we'll you. Do. Ron, thank you very much. It's been an absolute you pleasure and gentlemen. Thank you. You bet. Bye now. Thanks, Ron. Bye. Okay, folks. That was Ron Harmond from Big Equipment. Um, hang on a from big equipment. Um, Ron is an absolute gentleman. That was my second interview with him. We had a bit of a mishap with the, the first interview, but um, Ron is a gentleman. Um, hopefully that will be that. Um, thanks again to Ron and thanks to all his staff at Big Equipment Company. Um, they do all major repairs. So if you have a big boat or a versatile or a Steiger or an FW or something, um, get on to Ron and the, and the crew there. They'll, they'll start to all. I leave a link below in the description of the video. Um, and if you want to click on that, it will carry you through to the equipment company and anything else we kind of mentioned in the in the background. As for myself, go on to Morgan O'Flaherty on the podcasts, Morgan O'Flaherty Country Life, and you get all the podcasts. There's a podcast with Machinery Pete, um, Sherry from Heritage Iron Magazines, um, Ron's, Ron will be up there on a the podcast as well. And um, so on and so forth. And there's some great people talking about some great tractors and great cars and great machinery. And um, that's kind of it. I hope you enjoyed. Um, I hope you enjoyed what we've done. And um, likewise, I hope you'll come back to us again next week and we'll have something else for you. Um, that's kind of it for myself. Um, hit the like, hit the subscribe button, and um, hopefully a bit of more for you in the coming weeks. Cheers. Thanks. Bye now.